Church's YouTube channel. Is that on the app? There should be a link on the app, but I don't know if it goes to Vimeo or not. But if you just go to YouTube and just uh, uh, do a search for AM, AM Church of Christ, all of our videos are in one one place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. There you go. Uh, okay. You want to read the verses or whatever? Yes. Okay. Chapter 18, verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. <clears throat> and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will God not give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. <coughs> Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Um, so I like the beginning of the handout. It kind of captures it really well. Kind of what we've been talking about is if you just remove all the paragraph headings, then Jesus' teaching is broken up a lot less more. Not that the paragraph headings are bad, but that they can kind of make it look like Jesus is just teaching a bunch of random, unrelated things um, and then is crucified. But if you kind of have seen from for a while now, he's just been kind of one unbroken stream of teaching that is changing subjects and moving in and out, but it's all related to the text before and after. And sometimes there's a noticeable break. I think there's a noticeable break right after the rich young ruler where he, well, not even that, I'd say probably 19 is where there's a more noticeable break um, because, and it's still not a full break because he's still on the way to Jerusalem. So there's a bigger context, but within the bigger context of the called the travel log and that only Luke has, there's smaller context. So like there was that big context within the small context of the lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, um, dishonest manager, rich man and Lazarus was all, um, I think Jesus is attacking the Pharisees, kind of attacking the Essenes, attacking the Sadducees, attacking the Zealots, attacking, not attacking, but, you know, really going after their philosophy of how to interact with the world one in a row, and then kind of moving on from there um, to talking about children and then cleansing the lepers. And then he goes into his, what's called an eschatological discourse, which is the Olivet Discourse. So talking about what we call the second coming. Um, and I like that it ends, well, it's kind of a, almost like a dark, but happy thing, right? It's gonna be a dreadful day for, if you're not on the side of the son of man when he returns. Um, but then he immediately goes into a parable about a widow who's persistent against an unrighteous judge. And we, there's a really strong temptation to see that as separate from that. But that I think that's why Luke adds the preface, because Jesus didn't stop and say, I will now tell you a parable so that you will always pray and not lose heart. Jesus didn't do that. That's why mine's in, not in red letters, because um, Jesus didn't say that that's Luke's editorial comment. That's what it's called. Um, so he keeps going and he told them whether he whether he said that in this context or not. Luke stitched this story to the end of his Olivet Discourse, his version of the Olivet Discourse, um, so that you will have teachings related to that. I think this parable goes hand in hand with actually a different parable, because um, Jesus frequently taught in two parables, and then they're kind of broken up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke sometimes. I think this parable goes hand in hand with the um, parable of the reluctant friend. Remember, the guy comes to his friend in the middle of the night um, asking him, I need bread, I need bread, and basically the guy is reluctant to help him, doesn't want to help him. Um, the point of the teaching though, was that God isn't that way. So why do you think God is reluctant to help you reluctant to teach you God's not like a reluctant friend. I think this is hand in hand with that parable. God's not like a reluctant, unrighteous judge. So why do you act as if he is either way? Luke didn't feel that was the same way. So I guess he has precedence over what I think. So he stitched this to the end of the Olivet discourse. I wonder why then he would say, this is so that you, he very clearly said, this is so you won't lose heart and continually pray, uh, because he just told a really uh, a disheartening thing, which is kind of has been, we'll have more unfolding later, but it's about the Jesus now here now, but then the son of man is what he will refer to himself as the son of man returning. Um, it's book ended by uh, after the rich young ruler story in verse 31. And it says, taking the 12, he then again gathers them, reminds them what they're just like Luke has him remind him what they're doing. Remember, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everything that's written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles will be mocked and shamefully treated, treated and spit upon. Those are, that's all from the servant songs in Isaiah, which is, I don't want to get there, but it's really interesting by the way, he's saying everything written about the son of man, which is from Daniel will be fulfilled in Jerusalem. And what will happen is from the servant songs in Isaiah. That's exactly how you read messianic prophecy and exactly why I didn't understand what was going on. 
as if, but they understood none of these things. And then he does some stuff after that that I don't want to get to yet. Uh, but I think that's kind of a book end there of this discourse about the return of the son of man. And then this re reteaching about the return of the son of man being vindicated in Jerusalem. And then in between that is all these teachings on, I think it would be your heart and your standing before God. So I love, I love this whole discourse on what I would say discourse on faith, uh, which sounds so like simplistic, but it is if it's discourse on faith, which I don't think is as simplistic as we make it, but it is simplistic. If you break up the rich young ruler from the children, break up the children from the persistent widow, break that up from the, uh, the Pharisee and tax collector. If you break those up, it is simplistic teaching on faith. So the persistent, all that to say, to get to the persistent widow, he says, he said a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I think that's a common theme throughout this as well is your heart, not just faith, but your heart. So we're going to examine this widow's heart. And then the next one, we will see the difference in a Pharisee and tax collector's heart. Then we'll see a child's heart. Then we'll see the rich young ruler, rich ruler's heart. Uh, I say, I, if I habitually say rich young ruler, for some reason that's been hammered into my brain um, just to learn that Luke doesn't even say he was young. In Matthew, Matthew's the only one that says he is young. And so Luke says he's not young. And then he eliminates the phrase from Matthew. No, Ma Matthew eliminates the phrase, all these I've done from my youth because Matthew wants him to be older. It's a weird whole editorial thing but we'll get to that but anyway to see the rich young rich ruler's heart in how he more practically interacts with jesus um kind of laying these all out it's it's someone standing before god right so the judge you should immediately see judge in in the context of a parable be thinking that's god but the what jesus frequently does is has a has a character act completely uncharacteristic of themselves or what you would expect them to be which is going to happen twice here, multiple times, actually. So the persistent widow acts normal, but the judge, there's an unrighteous judge who neither feared God nor man. What kind of judge is that? You should be thinking, how on earth did this guy become judge? Who made him judge? That's a terrible judge, which is kind of the point. And then you see a Pharisee, which if you don't know that Pharisees were God-fearing righteous people and then within them were hypocrites, then you'll miss the whole point because it's another person acting uncharacteristic of themselves. But the point in that story also is that him and the tax collector are standing before God, like the widow is standing before the judge who represents God, like the rich ruler is standing for God the Son. So they get three stories, I almost said young, you get three stories of people standing before God and it gets more and more practical and kind of uh, realized and actual. See, how does this actually work out in your life? Because it's easy enough to have a parable about some widow coming to some judge who doesn't exist because it's a parable. And then saying, this is what you should do, because it, so then it gets more and more practical to there's an actual guy who is a ruler and comes to actual son of God. Let's see how his heart is after these parables. Anyway, it's kind of a broad sweeping overview. Hmm? Um, so in this parable, you can make the mistake, which sounds silly, but you can make the mistake of making prayer the focus of the parable. When I don't think that's the focus of the parable. Uh, much like the other parables that G or other teachings that Jesus has on prayer, Luke's not, at least in Luke, he's not trying to get you to be better at praying in and of itself. He's trying to get you to understand God better. And if you understand God better, you will pray better. So you can make this a parable of how you ought to be super persistent in prayer and, and white knuckle your prayer and, you know, back God into a corner and nag him. That's the whole point of the parable. That's actually, I would say, in my opinion, that's the opposite of the parable. Because the point is you have to do that with an unrighteous, unjust judge who neither fears nor God nor man. But the whole point of the parable is God is saying, I'm not that. So you don't have to be like this unrelenting, persistent widow. And there's actually a funny Greek phrase that, that Greg put in the handout about, uh, what is it like, she'll, he'll, she'll punch me in the head or something. Yeah, so yeah. it's like the, it's the same Greek word used for Paul saying, I beat my body and make it my slave and submit the flesh to his will, to the will of the spirit. Um, it's the same word. So it's either hype, like metaphorical or not. If it's metaphorical, he's saying, you know, I, this lady is going to disown me or dishonor me in front of everyone. I need to grant her justice. Or he's actually saying this woman might come slap me and that will also be dishonoring before everyone. I don't know, which is probably a metaphor, but I think it being literal is kind of funny. Um, regardless, the point is like God isn't that way. So the, the parable so that you ought to pray and not lose hope, not that you ought to pray and just exhaust yourself praying because you think God is some very stingy father who doesn't want anything good for you, doesn't want to vindicate you. Um, the, I think the, the kind of point to hang your hat on in this parable and the, the next one. Um, and remember in verse nine it says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He doesn't stop 
after this parable and then say that. He doesn't finish the parable and say, now I will tell you a parable about yada yada who thought they were righteous. He just keeps going and says, two men also went up to the temple to pray. He just continues into another parable, meaning they're related. And the, I know we didn't read this yet, but this will be important here in a minute, is that the, ver the word in verse 14 and the word in verse 8 in chapter 18 are the same root word in Greek. Meaning they're the same teaching, but he has to use one present tense, one future tense. Um, so verse eight, says, I tell you, will he, uh, he will give justice or vindication, uh, whatever, however you want to translate that to them speedily. Nevertheless, what will the son of man come when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? And then at the end of the Pharisee and tax collector, it says, I tell you, this man went home, same word in Greek, justified or vindicated or made right with God. So he's, he's connecting these teachings. Um, where am I even at? Um, so let's see. So yeah, so the, there's an unjust rule that neither feared God nor respected man. So it shouldn't be a, a judge. So it's purposefully hyperbolic. And there's a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. I think adversary is very important there. I can't prove it. I think it's very interesting. He would have adversary. Um, one, because that's very Lucan to have adversary. Uh, but that is also the word used for Satan. Maybe that's uh, your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking, seeking someone to devour from first Peter. Um, adversary is the word used for Satan, but the whole context of first Peter is that he's mocking, not mocking, but playing off of Nero's reputation as being a lion. And then he's saying your adversary, remember from the gospels, your adversary isn't Nero, no matter how bad and tempting it is to think your adversary is Nero. Your adversary is not Nero. Your adversary is the lion, Satan, not the lion. Nero, remember, so that's First Peter. I think Luke's doing the same thing, although that's Peter. I think Luke's doing the same thing. Saying this, this widow, someone who is um, very lowly in culture, not just in ours, but especially in theirs, because you had no one to help you, no one to vindicate you, no one to grant you justice. I mean, even a righteous judge, it would be hard, you'd think, to grant justice, especially in their day, because you would need a man to go stand with you before you had court to represent you, because your word as a woman in their time was not viable in court. So <laughs> the only tool she has is persistence and she uses it against the judge so he neither fears god nor man so he doesn't help the widow but she keeps coming and saying give me justice against my adversary same root word for a while he refused but afterward he said to himself though i neither feared god nor respected man so he gets the judge to acknowledge i don't fear god or respect man but because this widow keeps bothering me i will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming so he's like this woman like may as well be hitting me in the face over and over she's driving me nuts so i will give her what she wants and the lord meaning jesus said hear what the unrighteous judge says see that's where it's tempting to stop there and say now this is a parable about prayer this is how you should pray and this is how you should pray like the persistent widow who was just um, nagging god over and over this is how you should pray i think that's the opposite of the point because he says listen to what the unrighteous judge says and will not god and they would have known God to be the righteous judge who frequently in scripture is noted to love the widow, the poor, the orphan, everyone who is in the marginalized category. Won't God, the righteous judge by uh, relation, uh, won't God, the righteous judge, give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I wonder why he needs to remind them about the speedily return of God who won't delay long over them. Because he just went through a long teaching about how the son of man is going to come back and what will he find when he comes back um so he goes okay here's how you then while you're waiting for jesus to return is what we would say uh here's how you pray and don't lose hope you have you pray and don't lose hope by knowing who god is and what his character is like um, you don't pray and not lose hope by relying on yourself and your own persistence and willingness to persist although it is clearly taught in scripture that we should be steadfast and continuing in prayer um, i don't think that's the same as nagging god to death because uh, that first of all i guess you can't do that because he's god he's really tired um but that's not the proper view of god is that he's a reluctant unwilling to help father who doesn't want to help his children by jesus in mission won't god um give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night will he long delay over them i tell you he will give justice to them speedily nevertheless when the son of man comes will he find faith on earth so he's teaching about the heart of this woman being persistent and faithful in prayer. Will the son of man find faith on earth when he returns? And then we're going to get to a parable about what it looks like to have faith on earth. Um, I, th I think as many of these teachings, I hope you've seen so far are, is a great, there's multiple layers working. You don't have to pit them against one another. Uh, it can be both an allegory for Israel and an actual teaching for people who are faithful to God in any generation. Um, so I think another layer of that is, I think, I think it's clearly 
brought to the surface by Jesus by saying, will God delay over the vindication of his elect? That is Israeli language, not Israeli language, but language used for Israel as being God's chosen, God's elect, not just the New Testament, but in their own writings, their own um, prophets, God chose and elected Israel to be the nation through which all the nations on the earth would be blessed. So he's saying, won't now keep in mind, Jesus is we're getting into hot water here, but Jesus is redefining who is and isn't Israel, who is out, which we're going to see in the next passage. So will God long delay over the justification and vindication of his elect people? Um, of course not. But in the next story, we're going to look at who is and isn't his elect people because they think who would who else is going to be God's chosen people than a righteous God fearing Pharisee? Well, we're going to look at a parable where it's not about what's on the outside; it's on the inside. As you want to, if you want to go that way. Um, so I think that's very clearly a allegory about um, he, he will give you justice over your adversary, whether it's Rome or Satan, uh, but just be persistent and wait and trust in the character of God. Do you want to get the first text collector? Uh, well, I'd like to uh, see if anybody has any questions or observations. And I've got a question just about this last last verse here. But uh, thoughts, even online folks, any, any questions or need for clarification on anything? Have you all heard this passage taught as a passage on how to pray? Have you ever heard that before? With this I've passage? never understood this passage. <laughs> it's a tough one, right? I don't know that I understand it yet. But... Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's a tough one. It is it's about prayer, kind of. But it's about kind of all of Jesus' teachings, at least in Luke, from my, what I've studied is, it is about prayer, but it's not about you in prayer. It's about knowing who God is mm -hmm. in prayer. And so as you... Um, I can't even remember Jesus' early teaching on prayer in Luke, but it's just as you pray, know who God is like. He's not like an unwilling, unreluctant friend. So pray to God as a willing and helpful friend. He's not like an unwilling and reluctant judge. So don't pray to him that way because that's praying to a God who is, you're praying not to his character. You're praying to a God who doesn't exist. If you're praying to a God who's unwilling and, unreluctant, and reluctant to even help you or vindicate you. Um, so if you find yourself anxious and persistent, not persistent is the wrong word. That's a good word, but not in this sense. If you find yourself anxious and white knuckling prayer to death and feel like you have to back God into a corner just to get what you need, you're either probably your needs are wrong, which you need to trust that God knows your true needs, or you have a bad view of God who's reluctant and unwilling to help you. So I think that's a better way to look at prayer is it's, you don't need to pray better. You need to know who God is better. Um, that's also uh, Luke's teaching on, well, Jesus teaching in Luke on anxiety, you know, is it's not these things you need to fix. It's you need to know who God is. You misunderstood who God is. So well, the, the cultural ramifications are really important, and especially in this particular parable, because if we look at this through Western eyes, you know, we hear the word judge, we think possibly court. You know, it's just very, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very different because yeah. like you say, in this particular time, this woman basically had no status. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot we have to infer, but possibly, you know, there was something that went awry with her husband, with her inheritance or yeah. with uh, uh, you know, what the husband left, what he didn't, did he leave a mess? You know, is somebody trying to take advantage of her? Is yeah. that a play on words with the adversary language? And so I think seeing it in its cultural context, and there actually is some debate on, is the gentleman actually thinking about being worried about being physically struck? There is some debate on that. <laughs> yeah. Some scholars think that she was going to come and start literally smacking him around the head, yeah. you know, uh, which would have brought shame on him. But, but it does seem that it's like, consider the contrast. If this, if this judge, and it's almost even hard to use the term because he's so unjudged like, but if he's going to be able to figure that out basically in his flesh, how much more mm. is God yeah. going to lavish his grace on you, his mercy on you, his love on you um, as the, the, the ultimate righteous judge? Yeah. So, sorry, I kind of meandered there. No, that's perfect. Bit. That's exactly <laughs> how you study called the Calvet Omer parables, the lesser to greater. If this is true, if we can agree that this is true, how much mm. that a unrighteous fleshly um, judge who neither fears God nor man would eventually give vindication to this widow, how much more would a God who loves widows um, give vindication to them? That's how you read the Calvary Omer parable, huh? Yeah, if he cares for the birds of the air and the mm -hmm. lilies of the field, how much more would he care for you? Your human yeah. creation who has the image of God bestowed on him or her. It's like, how much more would he care for you? It's right. So in that sense, it's like, think about God better. So understand God's character better. 
revealed fully through Jesus. I get that in the scripture, but it's like, it's not pray more necessarily. And I hesitate to ever tell someone not to pray more, but it may, the better way, the better path to praying better may be reading your Bible more because you may be praying to a God who doesn't, I hate to hesitate to say doesn't, doesn't exist, but I say that hyperbolically. You may be praying to a God who you think is reluctant to help you and he is very willing to help you. So maybe read scripture before you pray, <laughs> read about the truths of who God is um, throughout the prophets who gives justice to people who are in need before you pray. And then you can pray to God in his character for who he is, you know, if that makes sense. Well, he's, he's, that's why he's going to show with the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee praying more doesn't actually work out. Yeah, well that's so, a good point. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, there's weird parallels with, it's, a, it's about heart. There's a whole debate in Jesus Day. Another whole underlying thing in this, I think, is there's a whole debate in Jesus Day about your kavanah. We've talked about this before briefly. Your kavanah in worship. How, how important is your heart in your obedience? Does it matter? Does it not? Meaning... And that sounds silly, like legalistic, but it's not. They were legitimate, like, you know, if um, someone is hurt on the side of the road and they need help, if I don't feel like doing it, but no, I should, should I help at all? Because my heart's not in it. Is that legalistic to them? They were like, is this legalistic to help them when I don't feel that in my heart? Whereas one side, they were all over the place, but one, the other side would say, no, you shouldn't help them, even if it's not in your heart, because God, you know, wants that anyway. It's God's heart. Um, so I think there's a whole underlying teaching of that too about we're about to see it. Oh, Jesus did it. He did. It's all about the heart, especially when you worship and approach God. It's not worship Him reluctantly, but it's all about your heart, as we'll see in the yeah. Pharisee tax collector. So there's parallels between like pray, pray, and then the character of God in both, and then um, justification in both of God's elect. But it's uh, I don't know, really interesting parallels. And then yeah, but I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the last question that Jesus asked in this section. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Mm. So if I'm seeing this correctly, there's there's two epochs of time, a minimum of two, that are interwoven in the passage because he's speaking present tense, mm. right? Yeah. But he's also speaking future tense. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's just kind of intriguing. You know? <laughs> it's all right. That's where the, the eschatological, the end, the end of time, the, the culmination of God's judgment, you know, starts, that, this is where it starts to... Um, yeah, I've also had trouble with, is he talking about now or what we would call second coming? Yeah. <laughs> when the Son of Man comes, we find right. faith on earth. I don't know, because that the narrative of Luke is that's what they're on the way to Jerusalem to see. Mm -hmm. Are we going to find faith in Jerusalem or will we not? Which I, that's a great introduction to the, this parable, the mm -hmm. Pharisee and tax collector is two men went up to Jerusalem to the temple to worship. Interesting, because we're all on the way up to Jerusalem to the temple to worship for Passover. I want, so meaning, how's it going to go in Jerusalem? Yeah. So Jesus is kind of prefacing the whole way to Jerusalem. How is this going to go? Are you going to repent? Are you going to trust in my kingdom? Are you going to try to make me king and overthrow them like the Maccabees? What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And then we get to see kind of Jerusalem, how it turns out, which kind of culminates in a few different spots, which is cool. But so, yeah, it's kind of we're already on the way to the temple and to worship. So how is it? How is your heart going to be in worship? Are you going to worship God truthfully or self-righteously? But All right. So anyone have any other questions or thoughts? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so now we're seeing uh, the main character being the antithesis to God. Yeah. So to me, it seems like there's a whole lot of inferencing going on mm. that's not really explained. Well, that is exactly what's happening. So I'm glad you picked up on that because they lived in a culture that just they were steeped in parables all day. So to just say there was a king who went to a faraway country was like the start of like a million parables to them. So when Jesus says there was a king who went to a faraway country, you're like, oh, it's God. That was always, king was always God. The farmer was always God. Um, the judge was always God. But then he uses a hyperbolic one, which are parallels in rabbinic literature. But there's hyperbolic ones to show that's not what God's like, which is also the point. It's a kind of a antithesis parable. Say, you could say a parable about this is what God is like, but Jesus found it to be more impactful to give a parable about what you're expecting God to be like, but he tells a completely opposite parable. Which is he's, I mean, always does. It's, you know, you expect the father, which is always God in parables, you expect the father to reject the younger son when he comes home. But he comes home and does the opposite of what you expect because that's he's showing you what the father is like. So it's a, and I mean, there's a funny one later in Luke where the king goes so far away. The king, what does the king say? I, uh, I know. I, I was, and I sorry, he gets the king to admit about himself um, that I was unjust and cruel. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, he's like, it's funny, but it's, 
is yeah he's exactly he's using up op, an opposite to emphasize what is true of god yeah. which is something you don't have to explain to a culture that's steeped in oral tradition and parables but for us it kind of takes a lot of like work to get there yeah and luke does it luke does the opposite thing quite a bit as we've already talked about multiple times yeah and so in, the, in his narrative style this actually fits in yeah pretty pretty well so well, let's let's see if we can tie what's in this section with uh, this next section. So if you guys want to take a little bit of time and talk about the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You want to read it? Sure. Read it uh, nine. Eight, eight, nine. Okay. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Um, so... I think if that last one was a little blurry, this I think the point of this one is to make that one a little more clear uh, because he has a, a, an equally true parable about someone standing before the judge, but in this case, it's not. Well, it is the judge because it's funny because at the end of the parable, he gives a sentence. He says, I tell you, this man went home justified, meaning made righteous before God because God, the judge made him justified. So now you see the how in the last parable, if that was a righteous judge, as we know God is, um, how does he judge now? And we'll see that he doesn't judge on the basis of what's on the outside, but what's in your, your heart. So it's a more clearly focused image of kind of the last picture with God as a righteous judge that we know him to be. Um, a few really key things in there is two men went up to the temple to pray. And when pray doesn't mean to pray. Um, pray, going up to the, well, pray means pray, but going up to the temple to pray uh, means what we, it's the same equivalent we would call worship. You don't go up to the temple to just say a prayer and then go back home. That's not what they thought. They knew that they could pray anywhere. It's the same way that you'd say you went to a Church of Christ at 1030 for worship. We're not just coming here to worship, but we're in our worship is singing and a sermon and prayer and meditating on scripture. If we have time for that in Lord's Supper. And so when you say you go into worship, you don't have to list everything you're saying. But worship to us, that word is equivalent to going up to the temple to pray. Their word, that's even true today. I mean, even in the Middle East, you say you go to the mosque to pray and you go to the mosque to worship, to study Quran, to sing. Um, it's not just, it's true of all kind of Semitic backgrounds um, still today. So I, first of all, that has a few implications elsewhere. Uh, Jesus, when he broke away alone to pray, <laughs> does not mean he just broke away alone to pray. It means he broke away alone and I think if you read that through kind of rabbinic eyes, it means he broke away alone and he would have prayed out loud, always prayed, always prayed out loud, whether it's kind of under their breath or not. If you've been to the Western Wall, you see that kind of mumbling, monotone, they actually shake and stuff too, but it's a kind of under a monotone praying, uh, but always out loud. And I think Jesus, when he broke alone, would have sang to God. I think he, a few things, you know, sang, prayed, meditated on scripture, blessed God, praised God and just words, stuff like that. Um, so it's not more than just Jesus sitting on a rock somewhere like a monk just sitting there praying. It's a very, I mean, they are not necessarily sitting on a rock, you know, in silence type people, The especially the first century rabbinic Jews. Um, they're very animated. So two men, in the, what you got to see in that is two men didn't just go up for, it's not like a, kind of like the Roman Catholic tradition is that kind of the church is always open during the day hours. And you can kind of just go whenever you want and you'll go and there'll be two people sitting in wherever praying at the altar. That is kind of our idea of it, but that's not what the temple was like. This is, I think it's talking about a corporate temple service, which changes some things. I know that sounds insignificant, but it changes some things. So two men went up to the temple to pray. Um, and so for a, a temple service, I think is interesting to kind of go through real quick. Um, it's basically 9 a.m. or 3 p.m. I know we kind of have that pretty, 3 p.m. is definitely more sharply at three. Nine is kind of when it ends. Um, so 9 a.m. or 3 p.m., they would kind of separate into their court, the Gentile court. Um, the, which that is, even that is important. If you know, it's a temple worship service and the Pharisee who's Jewish can see the tax collector is the tax collector, Gentile or Jewish. He's Jewish because if he's Gentile, he wouldn't see him. He's in a different court. <laughs> it's like every little detail matters because it has some cultural ramification. I think it's, a, I think it's fascinating. Um, so he sees a tax collector, meaning despised by everyone. 
So Pharisee, and what you see in the Pharisee before you get to see him pray is Pharisee, God-fearing, righteous, honoring man by his own admission. He, by his own self-righteous admission, though he gives all his tithes, he prays to God, he, whatever. He has all the books balanced for his own righteousness in his mind, but that you don't find it out till later. To them, when you hear the word Pharisee, you're hearing a God-fearing, God-honoring person. If you hear the word Pharisee and hear scumbag, then the whole point of the parable is gone because you, the point is a role reversal that the Pharisee ended up being unrighteous and the uh, tax collector was made righteous. Um, so two men went up to the temple to pray. Basically what they would do is uh, they have a sacrifice daily at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. They would start on the steps of the temple and then the priest would ascend to the altar and they would have the Levitical choir, meaning all the priests who wasn't the priest offering the sacrifice, which was a ton of them. They would all sing the Ascent Psalm, Psalm, I think I, I might get this wrong. I think it's Psalm 113 to 120 or the Ascent Psalms. They chant the Ascent Psalms as he's approaching and going up to the temple, uh, going up to the altar, going up the grand ramp to the grand altar, is what it's called, um, with a lamb or whatever animal they're sacrificing. Um, and all the Levitical choir is clanging cymbals, playing lyres, uh, whatever instrument they were playing. And they were chanting the Ascent Psalms as he went up to the altar. And then they would kind of reach a climax or a crescendo of their music and of their singing. Um, and they would then kind of come to a silence and then the lamb's throat would get slit and they would catch the blood in a bowl, you know, throw the, the blood around the base of the altar. And then they would, the altar was already lit on fire. Um, and they would throw the, cut up the pieces of the lamb, throw it into the fire for a burnt offering to God. Um, it would be very silent at this time. And then a different priest, some people say the same priest, but a different priest, I think, goes then to the holy place. So there's the, you got to, I mean, that we can't do a teaching on that imagery of the temple, but just the imagery of the temple real quick is like, you go to the altar, you need to make an atonement for yourself before you approach God. Very, um, but it's kind of rooted in the first pages of the Bible where they're kicked out of Eden and now they can't get back into Eden unless they, there's someone guarding, an angel guarding the uh, entrance with a sword. Um, but that's very old imagery goes makes an atonement goes into the holy place offering incense which was 21 different kinds of incense mixed together offering incense before god and so while he's offering incense before god he himself is praying on behalf of the nation but also himself and pleading with god to have mercy on us because that's what the sacrifice then represented was god promising to have mercy on his people and not count their sins against them if they repented and followed and put away idols and trusted in god so he's um offering this incense to God, which at that time, when he's offering incense to God, asking for mercy for the nation, is when everyone in the congregation would individually ask for their, they would say prayers. And it, it wasn't, they would all say the same prayer as they all said their own prayer. And they would say it out loud, but it would, you gotta, we should do that sometime. It's everyone out loud says a prayer for yourself. You're not listening to the person beside you, but it's just a beautiful image of hearing thousands and thousands of people at their temple service praying out loud at once and knowing that God can hear all those prayers at once distinctively at the same time. It's a beautiful image. Picked up in Revelation 8, by the way, when John says, says that um, the, the prayers of the saints are the incense offered up to God in Revelation 8. John very much showing his, his understanding of a Jewish temple service when our prayers are the incense given to God, that it's a pleasing aroma to him. Um, so that then is when they're pleading on pleading to God to show them mercy is when you said a prayer for yourself to, to ask for the mercy of God. And that's where you get shocked by this parable is that the Pharisee takes this time to talk about his own righteousness. It wasn't just a random prayer by the Pharisee saying, ah, you know, what should I pray for today? I'll just thank God that I'm not like this tax collector. No, he, in this moment, when they were praying all together, asking God to have mercy on them because the lamb was a sacrifice on behalf of the nation, he uses it as an opportunity to talk about his own righteousness and what he's done. And that thankful that he's not like that tax collector over there they can see. So he, it's, he stands, which is their position for prayer. And he looks to heaven, which is their position for prayer. And then talks about himself. It's actually, the Greek is actually kind of obscure. You may have a footnote. The, some manuscripts say, well, not some manuscripts, but it's, the Greek could also be rendered. Um, and he prayed to himself, <laughs> meaning he like stands to God to address God and prays to himself like he's God, which is kind of the point. And then somewhere in the distance, a tax collector in sight is out at the back um, and he says he can't even look up to heaven and he beats his chest, which is uh, for extreme, uh, what would you say, extreme grief, yeah. mourning, yeah. extreme mourning, that's what I was looking for, extreme mourning, which uh, that's a very, it's actually a very female thing to do. That was very common for females to do in their culture. Only other time a man does it in the Bible is when Jesus is crucified. Mm -hmm. It's the only time someone beats their chest and um, out of grief. 
so he beats his chest out of great men and for regard men usually tear their the collar of their shirt down mm -hmm. which is what the father does when jesus is crucified he tears the veil from the top to bottom he's showing his grief like a father would mm -hmm. um so he's beating his chest asking god to have mercy in that word is it's mercy yes but i, I it's the word that paul even uses for propitiation mm -hmm. atonement god may he's always looking at this sacrifice and saying god have atonement for me have atonement for me while this guy contrasting um, to from, contrasted from him is saying, God, look how righteous and, and self-righteous I am. So that's like a, a, I don't know, just for me, putting it in that context of the temple service adds so much more background to it. And that it's, it's not just a random prayer showing their heart. It's that in this pivotal moment for the nation being um, before God and asking for a sacrifice and asking God to have mercy on him, he instead uses it as an opportunity to talk about himself. Um, you got anything? Um, I want to see if anybody has any questions or observations about what Tyler just covered there. I don't want to go too far too fast. Isn't there an analogy here between this Pharisee praying and the older son? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there a heart, a heart analogy going there? Pharisee and the older son is yeah. the question that Alan asked. Yeah, yeah. The older son was just as lost as the younger son. Only yeah. He never left his backyard. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's like kind of, to me, that's um, a great, that was kind of the point of the lost son parable was that it kind of culminates in this moment. The son is found, but it doesn't finish there. It has a, almost a sad ending of the, the older son turns out to be lost the whole time too, because he thought he could earn his father's favor and didn't freely receive it because he was just his father. So it's like kind of a sad ending in a, in a second teaching on the lost son parable, which I think this is the same thing. Is it? That's kind of continuing throughout Jesus teachings to the Pharisees who are being self-righteous. You know, it's um, you think you can earn God's favor and it's not given to you. Um, so I think this is absolutely, yeah. Part of that is they think they can, earn God's favor or it's self-righteous and it's um, it's earned through external obedience and not your heart. Your heart has no place in uh, your obedience, they thought. What do you think about this last phrase here? Um, Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself mm -hmm. will be exalted. Um, what, what might that humility look like and what might that exalting look like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what would the humility look like? I think, I think the point is he kind of applying that to both of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You know, the one who exalted himself was the one who talked about himself and trusted in his own self-righteousness, uh, which is how it starts. He trusted, he told the parable that some trusted in themselves that they were righteous, which is fine. You can trust in your own righteousness and trust mm -hmm. that you're walking faithfully with God and treated others with contempt. Well, that's the bad part is that he, he was so righteous that it ended up being self-righteousness and he treated others with contempt. Um, so I think that's what it means to be, to exalt yourself is to go to, I mean, that image of going to the temple to worship God, plead with him to show you mercy and you use it as a, a, a instance to prop yourself up. Whereas being humbled would be the tax collector making himself nothing and lowering himself, which is a hard, I mean, that's such a hard teaching of Jesus, the switch of. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you and, know, guess, yeah. And, I'm, and I'm thinking when I ask the question, is it God who's doing the humbling mm. or is it the actions of the individual that will lead, you will lead to your own humbling? I mean, I think I see, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah <laughs> both levels, right? Yeah. Both play at the same time. I mean, right? Both. I mean, it's a hard thing. That's another hard teaching about this and greatness is Jesus. They asked Jesus and Matthew as he's approaching triumphal entry, kind of a different tone, but they're talking about their own greatness. And Jesus doesn't say, why do you want to be great? You shouldn't want to be great. Only God is, he doesn't say that. He says, oh, you want to be great? Let me teach you what great greatness is. Mm -hmm. He reframes, says, oh, you want to be great? I'll show you what greatness is. Greatness is serving anyone, serving everyone and making yourself lowest. That's what greatness is. It's not don't be great. It's redefined not by the world standards what greatness is. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing here. It's not, it's not don't ever want to be exalted. It's exalted isn't like worship, like we exalt God. Yes. It's lifted up, vindicated. <laughs> Again, mm -hmm. I haven't checked if that's the same word, but you know, anyone lifted up, and, you know, basically vindicated, you shouldn't not want that, but you should want it in the right way. If your way of doing that is doing it yourself, then it's kind of, that's the way to humble yourself. It's a very opposite idea. I mean, it just goes straight in the face of what the world would say, you know, making yourself nothing is actually the path to exaltation. Mm -hmm. Okay.
I've heard this text preached many times. Um, I don't really know that I ever heard anyone actually tie this as well as Tyler has done to what was happening in the context of the temple and how it, you know, how that plays into it. So thank you guys for painting that picture. I think it's really helpful to understand exactly what's going on here. So um, one other thing is I forgot that he, he, he says, have mercy on me. And the Greek is he had mercy, have mercy on me, the sinner, which is funny because he does what the Pharisee did. He puts himself in his own category and se separated him from himself and made himself unclean also. He says, have mercy on me, the sinner. He made it the sinner his title. Mm -hmm. Like the Pharisee said, think of it as I'm not like the tax collector. Um, it's interesting. So it's interesting, different than Greek there. That's not, we it translates a sinner because that's modern, that's good English. But the Greek is, have mercy on me, the sinner. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I would think a lot about similar to the prodigal son story that was just mentioned is our, the application, I think, kind of needs to be the same. Because we generally, which is a good problem to have, but we generally understand that repentant people who are living a wicked, sinful life, if they repent generally from a heart that is truly repented, God, of course, has mercy on them. I don't know many people that have problems with that. Praise God, that's an effect of the gospel on just the world, that that is almost accepted. Um, but the other side is like, if you walk away from this parable saying, wow, I'm really, like, if your application is, I'm really glad I'm not like the Pharisee, then Jesus has had, got a wonderful parable for you. And it's about two men who went up to the temple to pray. You got to keep rereading it until you realize, oh, I can't just be like, well, I don't want to be like that Pharisee. He's the worst. It's like, well, that's the point is you're trusting in your self-righteousness and it makes you look down on other people as um, thinking you earned your righteousness. So then you think they haven't done enough to earn their righteousness, which is exactly what the Pharisee thought. Um, you know, if you're like, well, I repented and I repented from a pure heart. Well, it's like, well, that is not true repentance is repentance that looks down on other people. And that's hard too. Cause we kind of, kind of rehashing what we talked about in the lost son, you know, it's Jesus had enough room at his proverbial table for not just a repentant sinner, but a, um, legalistic person who's been in church their whole life, who, um, is very old school and, you know, holds everyone to a high standard. If you know someone like that, it's like, it's, he has enough room at his table for someone who comes in fresh off the streets and is repentant as a lot, an older son who needs to come home too. So like if we push that older son out, we're, we're, we're the parable all over again. You know, we're missing the whole point. If we're pushing people out on the basis of, you know, strict adherence to the rules, it's like, well, Jesus didn't even do that. So the parable is now flipped, but it still has a great meaning, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I don't want to put you guys on the spot. I'd like to ask a question and I'd like for anybody to speak to this that wants to. Um, you, you made a really good observation earlier that God does look on the heart. Mm -hmm. And so as we think about forms of worship, there's, a, there's importance there. I mean, God was very meticulous, particularly in the former covenant about the forms and they served very specific purposes and they were designed to elicit very specific outcomes. And God was often pleased or displeased based on yeah. how well Israel observed the commandments. So the tug of war seems to be if something is repetitive over time. Is my, is my heart still in it? And, um, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm having a hard time articulating the question, but how important is it that we get the forms right versus just being brutally honest about where our hearts are. Yeah. Boy, what? A great Can you sum that up you. in three minutes or? Uh, I mean, or, or yeah, I mean, there's, that is kind of the, to me, that's such a core teaching of the prophets mm -hmm. of, <laughs> I get frustrated because I'm almost, in my mind, I'm almost like an old fashioned, old school Church of Christ person, if you can say such a thing. It's like, because like, it, <laughs> I mean, God cares about your heart in worship. And I know we think that, but do we do that? Mm -hmm. Do we actually, think that God cares about your heart and worship, or does he think um, it's okay if you just go through the motions, right? Because going through the motions with, I'll just say it, going through the motions with instruments or without instruments is rebellious to God in my mind, because it's not from the heart. You can go, you can have a great sounding instrumental worship and your heart is rebellious against God. Who cares? I don't think it matters to God at that moment if you have instruments or not, because your you're kavanah, your heart wasn't in worship. Meanwhile, the underground church in China can have absolutely nothing, don't even have hymn books to sing. So they sing verses out of John that don't even rhyme together. And I'm sure God looks up on that and smiles, not because of the manufactured emotions that that service gave them, but because that was their heart in that moment. 
there's an interesting teaching. I think in Isaiah, you may be able to be able to remember better than me of like, um, Jesus, God says, when you come together, when they're worshiping, he's like, you fast, but you're fist fighting each other. He's like, your worship isn't true worship. You worship from a, a dirty heart, meaning you fast and think that that's an act of worship. But in fact, you're fighting with one another. You're beating each other up. Um, you're not holding, you're holding sins against one another. You're not repenting of sin. I think that's massive in worship. That's why, I mean, I, this is purely opinion, but I wish we took Lord's Supper before at the beginning of service, because that's a time to I'm getting into opinion area here, but time to communally repent and purify Christ's body of sin as we repent and turn our hearts back to God in a new commitment to God's covenant. And then we enter him in worship. Like we enter him in worship before we recommit to him and repent of our sins for the week. Although you can do that individually in your mind and heart. That's, that would be, you know, legalistic to say everyone has to do that. But I just, man, I think it, just reading through the prophets, your heart and worship matters so much to God that I get a little bit nervous, like a very old school person about the talk about instruments or not instruments because i'm just like man if you can't worship god in spirit and truth without instruments trying to add them and not working on your heart is trying to manufacture emotion for god that you don't have which is legalistic <laughs> so it's like mm -hmm. do with that what you will i have no preference either way but it's like our and that was a raging debate in jesus day that jesus stuck his foot down and says no your heart is the only thing that matters actually um, but yeah, that's just my two cents. Don't shoot the messenger. I don't work here and you don't have well, the inverse there, is, so. the inverse is true as well. It, it could be any, any act of worship. And that was my, and that's a term that I, I don't act of worship. Isn't even a phrase in the Bible. Is it, is that a phrase in the Bible? I don't know. I'm trying to recall. Act of worship. I think it was a category that we develop, but that could be true of anything. Yeah. It could yeah, be true of absolutely. anything, anything that is, is we think. Because it's exactly what the Pharisee is doing in this passage. Yeah. It is by me crossing my T's correctly and dotting my I's correctly that I am a righteous man. Yeah. Which yeah. at some level is true because he's doing what God asked him to yeah. do. But the heart. But that's, the, that's the debate in Jesus' that's day. The issue. Yeah. <laughs> it's which, does your heart follow the obedience or does obedience follow from a pure heart? Right. Mm. And that, I think Jesus makes a clear statement of obedience follows a pure heart. Obedience is always good always the answer if it follows a pure heart and a pure repentant heart is one that worships god if you try to obey before having a heart that's repentant and worshiping god now you're trying to turn god's favor upon yourself by obeying which is the definition of legalism it's short-circuiting god's grace it's thinking god's grace is so cheap and insignificant you can earn it by doing some rules um which has a lot of applications to many things but okay so we're all good right we just figured that out the whole <laughs> yeah. uh Yeah. Because if you think about Jesus, his focus was always God. Mm. He was God. And he was not trying to control anything. As, you know, the, the Pharisee was, was, the focus was the Pharisee. And he was trying to control the environment, the situation, yeah. everything. Right, right. But you'll notice that, you know, when Jesus was crucified, his, he could have done all the things he could have done because he was who he was. Yeah. But his whole goal was submission. Mm. His focus was God, and it was all about God. Yeah. yeah. And and these guys, you know, you can clearly see he had the fo the right focus and he had the right control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. This would have been a this would have been a, a hard teaching. I mean, it's a hard teaching now. <laughs> yeah. But if you, you know, if you were in this in this, uh, well, especially if you look at the Pharisees that way. Yeah. I mean, I honestly related it today, and I hesitated to say it or not, but I guess this is a green light now of like, um, this won't be controversial. I just didn't know whether to use it as an application or not. Sorry. Um, of like, I think comparable to this, how they would have see, seen the Pharisee reacting in this way would be like, if we're having Lord's Supper, right, it, which is um, remembering and recommitting ourselves to Christ's covenant, um, where we repent and purify Christ's body corporately and individually of our sin, corporately and individually as we repent and recommit ourselves. And then someone just comes before the stage or whatever and is just bowing down and crying and beating their chest, worshiping God. And then you get a glimpse into Greg's heart and he's saying, wow, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. You'd be hurt. You'd be like, I can't believe that's in, inside of Greg right now. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly how they would have thought about this Pharisee is. I couldn't believe Rabbi Simeon would have said that. Uh, who, how, how does that end him? And that's kind of the whole point is he's re redefining, says God will justify his elect. Then he goes into parable about but who is and isn't basically on the son of man's side 
and it has nothing to do with external circumstance, but about your heart in how you worship God. So it's a, it's a to them it would have been shocking to us because we've beat down Pharisees for two thousand years. It doesn't have any any. It's not very interesting, but to them it would have been mind blowing. Well, and then what I'm wrestling with in my own faith journey right now is how much I have I have westernized all of this. And I really am. And I'm really, uh, I'm struggling in a good way. I'm wrestling in a good way because I think when I now read, um, you know, like Paul's counsel, for example, in his letter to the Corinthians, that when you come together, everyone has a hymn, everyone has a word of encouragement. Everyone has a, you know, a prophecy of prayer because in the, in the community, it's not just the preacher who shows up full of the Holy Spirit <laughs> and the preacher yeah. has a word of proclamation, right? Oh, the yeah. church shows up with the Holy Spirit. Church has a word of proclamation, yeah. affirmation, worship. I've actually been in an assembly where what you described happened, where everybody's praying out loud at the same time. It was one of the most mm -hmm. beautiful things I've ever yeah. participated in in my life. It was one of the most powerful prayer times that I've ever had. And, it, and, and you know, it was just... Um, the, the, the noise and there was this it was a rhythm that started to develop it was, I don't know it was just a pretty pretty cool thing yeah. and um, I was thinking know. of what you said like if, if we this is again opinion area but if we get to the point where it's the preacher who shows up with the spirit to to do church mm -hmm. service on Sunday then church very quickly becomes something that can just be backed away from and put online mm -hmm. because if church then very quickly gets watered down to just a sermon because he's the one coming, he's the one performing, he's the one bringing the Holy Spirit and worship and truth, not us. But we're we're the body assembling. It's like a, a sermon is a part of that, but it's like, uh, you know, that's a very thin and watered down view of church if it's something that is just replaceable online um, and not Christ's body assembling in, to worship and in, in full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's, some churches are sermon-centric, some churches are worship-centric, yeah. some churches are prophecy center, exactly. whatever it might be. I think what you said earlier, Jan Lisa nails it, that it's, we need to be Jesus centric. You know, Jesus is our focus and should be the heart of the heart of what we're about. I think you boil this down to its essence. That's how he's describing kingdom. I'm personifying the very thing I'm trying mm -hmm. to help you understand. So it is, uh, it's right at eight. We're going to go ahead and wrap up uh, right here tonight. Thank you all for allowing us to uh, deviate a bit and, and kind of uh, get into some interesting conversation areas. Appreciate you all being with us. We will, uh, uh, Tyler will share his email address with you later. Uh, just kidding. It's Greg uh, at amchurch.net. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's pray and we'll, uh, we'll be done for tonight. We'll start with verse 15 next week. Father, thank you for the blessing of this time together. Thank you, Lord, for places where we can just have open dialogue, knowing that we're loved. And Father, uh, even beyond that, knowing that we love you, and uh, Father, we want to please you as your sons and daughters. And so, uh, Lord, may all that we uh, do and say bring glory and honor to you. And when we fall short, may we rest in your grace uh, that is ours through Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Good night, everyone. <laughs> I wonder who, how many, how many people think we're waiting at that? <laughs> we're waiting at <laughs> <laughs>